CD1, Track 1, Cambridge Global English, Stage 5, by Jane Boylan and Claire Medwell, published by Cambridge University Press. This recording is copyright 2014. Track 2 What always surprises me about my granddaughter is the way in which she loves to take centre stage. She doesn't get nervous at all and seems quite at home speaking to lots of people. I just don't understand why he gets so angry. If we don't pass him the ball all the time, he just stops playing and walks off the football field. I really admire my friend Aisha. She's so studious. She loves learning about new things and always has her head in a book. Needless to say, she always gets top marks in class. Camilla is my best friend. She's such a kind, generous person. We share everything. Our pencils, our pens, our secrets, and our sweets and chocolates, of course. Come on, Natasha. Why are you hiding? It's my friend. She's just saying hello to you. Cheng is a very tidy person. He always tidies up his bedroom and puts his food wrappers and empty bottles in the bin in the park. Track 3 Hi, my name's Santiago. I'm from Argentina. I'm 11 years old and I live with my family, my mom, my dad and my little brother in Buenos Aires. I've got two pets, a hamster and a dog, and I play football and basketball for the school team. I've got two best friends, Pedro, who is in my class at school, and my cousin Luca, who I've known all my life. What do people like about me? Mm, well, I suppose I'm quite outgoing and cheerful most of the time, so people think I'm fun to be with. What do I like about me? Well, I'm quite a tidy person. I hate it if my bedroom gets messy. I'm also a patient person, especially with my little brother. What could I improve about me? Well, my family would say that I am very bad-tempered when I get up in the morning. It's something I really need to change. Track 4 Hello, Ben. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Tell me about your family. Have you got any brothers or sisters? Yes. Max, a younger brother, who is a bit of a pain. Where were you born? I'm from... Sorry, what I meant to say was I was born in a small town called Flinttown in the USA. Tell me about yourself. What are you like? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? Yes, of course. What are you like? Well, I'm quite a confident person, and I like to do things properly. Although I'm not sure if my mum would agree with my last point. I'm quite popular at school too, I suppose. Who are your best friends? Well, my best friend is Mickey. He's really good fun. We've been friends for as long as I can remember. I think we met when we were babies. What are you good at at school? I don't think I'm good at many things, to be honest. Well, Mrs Jones would say I'm good at singing, but I don't agree with her at all. I'm good at drawing, and I'm quite good at sewing too. But don't tell anyone about that last one. Do you have a favourite sport? No, I don't excel at any sport. 
Once Dad thought I was going to be a great rugby player, so he made me join the local team. But he was wrong, of course. What are your favourite things? Well, that has to be my mega collection of video games. I absolutely love playing them. Mickey and I play quite a lot together. Then there's my collection of comics. I remember when Mickey and I wrote our own comic strip, Zippy Racer. Track five. One. Where were you born? Two. What are you like? Three. Who are your best friends? Four. What are you good at at school? Five. Do you have a favorite sport? Six. What are your favorite things? Track seven. Air. Spare. Rings. Sings. Me. Family. Long. Strong. Possess. Chess. Cars. Stars. Track eight. One. Hello, Maria. What's the matter? Well, I've got the stomach ache and I feel sick. How long has it been hurting you? Since yesterday afternoon, when I came back from my friend's party. What did you eat? I ate a few sandwiches, some crisps, and two large slices of chocolate cake. Hmm. Well, it sounds to me like you ate too much chocolate cake. You need to drink lots of water today and no chocolate. Two. Hello, Abdul. What seems to be the matter? I've got a sore throat and I've lost my voice. Yes, I can hear. Let's have a look at your throat. Say ah. Ah.、Uh... Yes, it's very red. Does it hurt when you swallow? Yes, it does. Well, you need to drink a lot of liquids and take this medicine twice a day. Three. Hello, Maya. What's the matter? I feel very cold and I keep shivering. My head hurts too. Have you been sweating at night? Yes, a lot. Well, I think you have a cold and a fever. Let me take your temperature. Open your mouth and put the thermometer under your tongue. Oh yes, thirty-eight point five. You'll need to take this medicine every four hours and drink lots of water and fruit juices. Four. Hello, Jess. What's wrong? Well, I keep sneezing all the time, and I got earache too. Have you been coughing? No, I haven't. But I feel dizzy, and I've got a very blocked nose. Okay, you are dizzy because of the earache, and you've got a cold. You need to keep warm, rest, and drink lots of water. I'll give you some medicine for the earache. Track nine. I started to feel ill in the evening. I had a headache and I felt a bit sick. Mum took my temperature, but it was normal, thirty-seven degrees centigrade. I started to feel much worse during the night, and when Mum took my temperature at seven a.m., it had risen to thirty-seven point five degrees centigrade. By eight a.m. It was thirty-eight degrees centigrade. I felt terrible and was sick a few times. Between eight a.m. and eleven a.m., my temperature rose to thirty-nine point five degrees centigrade. At eleven a.m., Mum called the doctor. She said I should drink a lot of water, get some rest, and have some medicine. 
She also said I should have plenty of fresh air in my room to keep me cool. Between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., my temperature dropped to 37.5 degrees centigrade, and then I started to feel a bit better. Track 11 Stone Soup Once there was a young man travelling around the country selling goods. Times were very hard, and every day he sold less and less until he didn't have any money at all. On the same day that he ran out of money and food, he came across a small village. He thought that in the village he would find someone who would give him a bit of food. He knocked at the door of a pretty looking house. A woman opened the door slightly. The young man asked the woman if she had a little food to spare for a weary young traveller, but sadly the woman answered that she had no food at all. Curiously, the same thing happened at all the houses in the village. There was not even a crumb of bread left in the entire village. The young man was not discouraged. Instead, he came up with a plan. The young man found a wealthy looking house in the centre of the village. An elderly man answered the door. The young man asked him if he had a large pot of water that he could spare. The old man asked him what he wanted it for. The young man explained that he was so sad about the lack of food in the village that he was going to make a big pot of soup for all the villagers from a special stone he had found on his travels. The old man gave the young man a large pot of water and a stirring spoon and helped him build a big fire next to his house. The young man took a smooth stone out of his bag and put it in the pot of water. As he stirred the water, the young man mentioned to the old man that the magic soup was always better with a little onion and a head of cabbage to add extra flavour. So the old man went into his house and returned with a bag of onions and a head of cabbage. A neighbour who was putting out her washing smelled the onions and the cabbage cooking. She went to the old man's house where she was told about the special soup made of stone. The young man who was stirring the soup mentioned that the magic soup was always very good, but that a little bit of meat, perhaps a carrot and some potatoes, would add some extra flavour. So the woman went into her house and returned with a chunk of meat, a bunch of carrots and a sack of potatoes. A little girl who was playing in the street smelled the soup and became curious about the smell. She went to the old man's house. The young man stirred the soup and mentioned to the girl that the magic soup was always very good, but it would be even better with a few beans and a pinch of salt and pepper. So the girl ran into her house and returned with a bowl of beans and some salt and pepper and added them to the pot of soup. The woman from the first house where the young man had asked for food was in her garden collecting some herbs and mushrooms. She smelt the soup and became curious about the smell. So she walked down the lane to the old man's house. The young man stirred the soup some more and mentioned that the magic soup was always very good, but that a few mushrooms and some herbs from her basket would add even more flavour. The woman gladly added her ingredients to the soup. In a while, the soup was cooked and everyone had a bowl of delicious stone soup. No one could believe that such a flavoursome soup could be made from just a stone. The young man served another bowl of soup and smiled to himself. Track 12 A sack of potatoes A pot of water A bunch of carrots A pinch of salt and pepper A bowl of beans Track 13 1 What's your name? I'm Peng and this is my sister Chang. 
How old are you? I'm 11 years old. What are your hobbies? Well, I quite like skating, but I prefer playing the violin. I'm really shy though, so I don't play for other people very often. My sister plays the violin too, but she's more confident than I am. 2. Hi, what's your name? I'm Maria and this is my sister Anna. How old are you? I'm 12 years old. Where are you from? I'm from Mexico. What are your hobbies? I love playing basketball in the local park. I usually go with my sister, but she's a bit lazy and prefers reading her magazine on the park bench most of the time. What are you like? Well, I suppose I'm quite a generous, outgoing person, really. 3. Hello there. What's your name? My name's Brad. How old are you, Brad? I'm 11 years old. Have you got any brothers or sisters? Yes. Here he is. My little brother Tom. He's eight. What are your hobbies? I'm crazy about surfing. And because I live by the beach, I can go every day. I'm really good at it. What do your friends like about you, Brad? I suppose they think I'm a cheerful and a sociable person. Track 14 This is my city, Shanghai in China. It's on the East China coast and is one of the most crowded cities in the country. It's quite a noisy city, but I love the colourful streets and the sound of busy people. It's very modern too, with high-rise office buildings and spectacular towers. There is also an ancient part of the city which is very popular with tourists. This is a photo of my village, Orta San Giulio, in Italy. It is a beautiful, peaceful place located on the banks of the Orta Lake. I love walking with my family and there are amazing mountains, forests and green hills. We often have picnics in the summer. It has a very small, pretty centre, which is very popular with tourists. Track 15 Part 1 I'm going to talk about my city, London. These are two photos of central London, past and present. This is a photo from the year 1910. We can see the first cars, quite a lot of them. There is also a double-decker bus on the left-hand side of the photo. If you look closely, you can see the spiral stairs that the passengers climb to get to the top deck. I think I prefer these to modern-day buses. The top deck has no roof, so it must have been great on a sunny day. Part 2 In the present day photo, we can see a lot of differences. There is a bicycle and some big black taxis called hackney cabs. There are double decker buses in this photo too, but they are more modern. There is also an underground station in this photo, which means the streets aren't as crowded as in the older photo. And there are traffic lights, which means it's easier to control the traffic. I definitely prefer modern London because it's easier to travel around now as we have the underground, although I really like the old cars and buses. Track 16 Part 3 A hundred years ago, English homes were very different from homes today. There was no electricity, so people cooked on stoves powered by oil or wood. There weren't any dishwashers to wash the pots and pans, or microwaves to heat food quickly either, so life was much more difficult than it is today. There were no televisions. Imagine that! and no mobile phones. 
People washed clothes by hand because there weren't any washing machines, and some homes had oil irons to press clothes. Track 17 Kneaded Painted Cooked Washed Walked Travelled Cleaned Used Track 18 The Lost City by Margot Fallis Part 1 Yong Hu and Ho Xing walked through the valley. I'm getting tired, Yong Hu complained. Where are we going anyway? We are going to find a city, a lost city. There are wondrous surprises that await the ones who find the ancient city. Does anyone live there? Yong Hu asked. Not anymore. At one time it was the busiest city in all of China. Why not? because it is too far out of the way for the trade routes. What kind of surprises are there? Good surprises? Yong Hu asked. Magical surprises, Ho Xing smiled. Come. Is there bamboo in the lost city? Yong Hu asked. Much. Good. Let's hurry up then. I'm starving. Part 2 after several hours, Ho Xing stopped. See the mountains ahead? We are nearly there. Another hour. Just then, they heard a growling sound. What was that? Yong Hu asked. A tiger. But it isn't near us. Its roar is echoing off the tall mountains. There it is. There is the lost city. We have found it at last, Ho Xing smiled. It is magnificent, Ho Xing. The walls are high and the roofs of the building sparkle in the sunshine. Are they made of jade? Yong Hu asked. There is much jade, ivory, gold, silver and even rubies. We must hurry, Ho Xing said. How do we get inside? Yong Hu wondered. We must climb these steps, Ho Xing said, pointing to very steep steps that led to the top of the wall. Yong Hu laughed and ran up the stairs. After he'd climbed twenty of them, he stopped and took a few breaths. I think I'll walk slowly up the rest of them. Part 3 Ah, oh, there is where we need to go, he said as he reached the top step. Over there, in the middle of the city. That is where we shall find our surprises, Ho Xing said. They climbed down the steps on the other side of the wall. We need to treat this place with respect. Be quiet. Don't touch anything until I say so, he warned his friend. When they reached the centre of town, a huge golden gong hung from poles. Several Chinese statues of lions surrounded it. Look at their ruby eyes, Yong Hu said. Can I bang the gong? he asked. Yes, the wiser panda said. Yong Hu picked up the stick and hit the gong. Part 4 When the noise stopped, silence filled the air. Crickets began to chirp. Listen, Ho Xing said. It is beautiful. When do we get the rubies and jade? Yong Hu whispered. Ho Xing ignored him and listened to the magical music of the crickets. The two pandas stood silently for an hour until the crickets stopped singing. Our surprise, Yong Hu whispered again. Yong Hu, that was our surprise. Nobody in the world has heard anything that beautiful before. 
It is our reward for our journey, Ho Xing said. Part 5 What about the jade? What about the gold, silver, rubies and ivory? Yong Hu asked. We cannot touch these things. They belong to the people who once lived in this lost city. You can eat all the bamboo you want, but the rest must stay within these walls, Ho Xing explained. At the mention of bamboo, Yong Hu forgot all about the precious jewels and riches. Bamboo! He ran off to search for his feast. Track 19 My favourite part of the New Year celebrations in my country is the Lantern Festival. We hang the lanterns from the windows in our houses and we carry them along the street too. Everywhere looks so pretty and magical. In my town, we have a dragon dance as well, which marks the end of the new year. A dragon, which is made of paper and silk, is carried along the street by boys who dance underneath it. It's great fun. Track 20 Diwali is celebrated between mid-October and mid-November. It is the Hindu festival of lights. It lasts for five days. People decorate their homes in bright reds, greens and yellows and they light lots of oil lamps in their homes, in gardens and in public places. Although the actual legends that go with the festival are different in different parts of India. Sham al Nasim is celebrated at the beginning of spring in Egypt. It lasts for one day and means the smell of spring. Egyptians go to the gardens and parks bringing their traditional food of the day with them, which is usually salted fish, coloured eggs and onions. The festival celebrates the start of spring and it was also celebrated by the ancient Egyptians. Track 21 my quinceañera celebration. As a Mexican girl, I will celebrate my coming of age when I am 15 years old. It's called the quinceañera celebration, and it celebrates the time when a girl becomes a young woman. For the ceremony, I'll wear a beautiful ball dress and a tiara, a pretty headband, which will be a present from my family for my birthday. There will be a ceremony with family and friends, and afterwards a reception, a type of party, where I will receive my gifts and celebrate with traditional food and music. I'm really excited because I'm having mine next year. My 21st birthday. Although some families in England celebrate the 18th birthday, in my family, we like to celebrate the special age of 21. So, I won't have a big party when I'm 18, but I'll have a big birthday party with lots of family and friends when I'm 21. My birthday is in the summer, so I'll probably have a party in the garden. My mum will make a big birthday cake, and I'll get a birthday present that I will keep forever to remind me of my big day. Everyone will sing happy birthday and I'll blow out candles on my cake. I'm looking forward to the party. It'll be really good fun. My coming of age day. When I am 20, I will celebrate my coming of age day. In Japan, this is the second Monday of January. I won't be a teenager anymore. I'll be an adult. On this special day, I'll receive my first kimono, a traditional dress for Japanese women. Kimonos are very expensive, and so I'll use it throughout my life for different ceremonies. During the ceremony, I'll receive a blessing. My family will be there, and they will sing songs and dance. After this, I'll go with my family to a restaurant and eat traditional food like sushi, noodles and rice. 
I'm looking forward to celebrating with my family and friends. Track 22 An extract from Horried Henry's Birthday Party by Francesca Simon Horrid Henry sat in his fort, holding a pad of paper. On the front cover, in big capital letters, Henry wrote, Henry's party plans, top secret. At the top of the first page, Henry had written, Guests. A long list followed. Then Henry stared at the names and chewed his pencil. Actually, I don't want Margaret, thought Henry. Too moody. He crossed out moody Margaret's name. And I definitely don't want Susan. Too crabby. In fact, I don't want any girls at all, thought Henry. He crossed out clever Claire and lazy Linda. Then there was anxious Andrew. Nope, thought Henry, crossing him off. He's no fun. Toby was possible, but Henry didn't really like him. Out went tough Toby. William? No way, thought Henry. He'll be crying the second he gets zapped. Out went weepy William. Ralph? Henry considered. Ralph would be good because he was sure to get into trouble. On the other hand, he hadn't invited Henry to his party. Rude Ralph was struck off. So were Babbling Bob, Jolly Josh, Greedy Graham and Dizzy Dave. And absolutely no way was Peter coming anywhere near him on his birthday. Ah, that was better. No horrid kids would be coming to his party. There was only one problem. Every single name was crossed off. No guests meant no presents. Track 23 1 Tough 2 Enough 3 Bought 4 Doe 5 Rough 6 Though 7 Thought Track 24 When I was a child, life was different from the life we live today. In the streets, rich people used horses and carriages to get about. There were a few cars, but not many. There were some buses, but much slower than the ones in the city today. We rode our bikes most of the time. It was the cheapest form of transport and it was good exercise too. Our houses didn't have all the electrical appliances we have today. We didn't have electric irons or dishwashers and we certainly didn't have a microwave. We cooked our food on wood stoves. Track 25 1 Alexander Graham Bell was a famous inventor. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1847. Like his father, Bell was a teacher. In 1870, he started research on sending sound over a wire. In 1876, he sent the first message over a telephone. Bell changed the world with his invention. He died at his home in Canada in 1922. 2. Frida Kahlo was born in Mexico in 1907. She started painting after she was hurt in a bus accident and was soon one of Mexico's most famous artists. She died in 1954 after many years of health problems. 3. Captain Cook was born in 1728 in Martin, England. He was an explorer who sailed most of the South Pacific. He was famous for his navigating and map-making skills. Cook was killed by the natives of the Hawaiian Islands in 1779. 4. Johann Sebastian Bach was a famous classical composer from the Baroque period. 
He was born in Germany in 1685 into a family of musicians and he composed many famous classical pieces including Air on a G-String and the St. Matthew Passion. He died in 1750. 5. Marie Curie was a famous scientist. She was born in Warsaw, Poland, in 1867. She made history in 1903 when she became the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Physics for her work on radioactivity alongside her husband, Pierre Curie. She died in 1934. 6. Steve Jobs was born in Wisconsin, USA, in 1955. He was an entrepreneur, inventor, and the co-founder of Apple Computers, which developed a series of revolutionary technologies, the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. He died in 2011. Track 26. Michelle Yeoh was born in Malaysia in 1962. She is a famous actress known for her roles in action and martial arts films, such as Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Nancy Ajram is a pop star from Lebanon. She was born in 1983 in Beirut. She released her first album when she was only 15 years old. Her music video for Fi Hagat was the most viewed Arabic music video on the internet. It had 31 million views on YouTube. Hayao Miyazaki is a Japanese film director and manga artist. He was born in Tokyo in 1941 and is famous for producing and directing Japan's most successful film, Spirited Away, in 2001. Arundhati Roy is a famous Indian writer. She was born in Shillong, in 1961, and is best known for her novel, The God of Small Things. Track 27 1. 28,000 2. 50 million 3. 5 million 4. 130,000 5. 545,000 Track 28 1 Today, I'm going to talk about my favourite actor, Jackie Chan. I think he's amazing. He was born on April the 7th, 1954, in China. His parents named him Chan Kong Sang, which means born in Hong Kong. When he was very young, he started to practice Kung Fu with his father every morning. When he was seven, he started to study at the China Drama Academy, where he learned martial arts, singing, acting and acrobatics. His martial arts skills are brilliant. I went to the cinema to see The Karate Kid. It was fantastic. Two. For my presentation, I am going to talk about Jane Goodall because I think she is a remarkable woman who has led an extraordinary life. She was born in London on the 3rd of April 1934 and lived between London and the beautiful city of Bournemouth by the Sea. When Jane was a child, she liked watching the animals and birds in her garden but she dreamed of travelling to Africa to observe exotic animals in their natural habitat. Jane became famous for her amazing work on the behaviour of chimpanzees in Tanzania. Track 29 1. Jane Goodall is British, isn't she? 2. She lived in London, didn't she? 3. She dreamed of travelling to Africa, didn't she? 4. Jackie Chan's real name means born in Hong Kong, doesn't it? 5. The Karate Kid was fantastic, wasn't it? Track 30
In the summer of 1768, Captain James Cook, a famous explorer, set sail from England on the HMS Endeavour on a three-year journey to discover an unknown continent on the other side of the world. Most of the crew didn't know that a young boy called Nicholas Young was hiding on the ship. This courageous boy wrote about the perilous voyage in his journal, which he filled with tales of hurricanes, disease, new lands and strange animals. Track 31 Extracts from The Stowaway by Karen Hess Part 1 August 1768 Sunday the 7th to Friday the 19th Plymouth With the help of seamen Francis Haiti, John Ramsey and Samuel Evans, I have managed to keep my presence aboard Endeavour a secret. She's a small ship and her company over 80 in number. It's a wonder I have not been discovered with all the coming and going of the men aboard, but I have not. The three seamen I paid to get me on bring biscuit and water. They make certain I exercise each night during middle watch, when there are fewer hands on deck. It's a good hiding place I've got, in a small boat Endeavour carries aboard her. I can look over the edge and see the deck without being noticed. But it is difficult, lying still, day and night. Part 2 Endeavour creaks without rest as she sits at anchor. The breeze chatters her ropes against the masts and the ship's bell clangs on the hour and half hour. With all the din of London, I thought it could never be so noisy on a ship. But it is. I've got chickens for neighbours and a goat. They cluck and bleat day and night in pens on the deck. I'm glad of their company. Today, the 19th, Captain Cook gathered the ship's company on deck and read the articles of war aloud. Captain is a clean-shaven man, strict and stern with cold eyes. Part 3 Sunday the 21st, Plymouth We toss at anchor. My stomach heaves and cramps and heaves again, and I'm bruised from head to toe. I wish my father would come aboard and take me home. I'm tired, wet and hungry. Father knows by my letter that I've run out on the butcher. But I did not write where I meant to go, nor what I meant to do, for when I sent the letter, I hardly knew my plans myself. Even if he knew, he would not come. I am a disappointment to father. All my brothers are scholars. Only I could not settle to my studies. Father has no use for a son who will not learn Latin. Part 4 Wednesday the 24th to Thursday the 25th. Plymouth I shall be patient. Father thinks me worthless when it comes to sticking with a plan. He says I run from everything. Well, I did run from Reverend Smythe's school, and from the butcher, but I had a good cause on both counts, and, unhappy as I am, cramped in the hard confines of the boat, I am better off than I was with the butcher. And so I shall remain, recording my trials in this journal. I shall prove to Father that I am not a quitter, that I am good for something, that I am more than a butcher's boy. Finally, the rain has stopped. This afternoon, at last, we weighed anchor. Now there are new sounds to join with the others. The wind is clapping the sails, the men singing out in the rigging, the water churned by Endeavour's prow. Fine sounds. Sailing sounds. CD2 Track 32 Cambridge Global English Stage 5 By Jane Boylan and Claire Medwell Published by Cambridge University Press This recording is copyright 2014 Mythical Creatures 1 
In Greek mythology, the Cyclops were huge, one-eyed monsters which liked to eat humans. They were locked in the underworld because of their horrible features. The legend says that the Cyclops only had one eye because they gave one away so they could see into the future. Two. People know Medusa for her hair made of snakes and because she could turn men into stone. The legend says that Medusa was a beautiful young girl, but she was also vain and always wanted to look in the mirror and see how beautiful she was. When she met the goddess Athena, the goddess punished her for being vain. She twisted Medusa's hair into terrible snakes and sent her to live with the blind monsters at the end of the earth. Three. He's about two to three meters tall and he is hairy. You don't want to run into him at night. He has been a mystery creature of the woods for hundreds of years and there have been recorded sightings of him all over the world. He sleeps in the day and looks for food at night. The creature is known by many names. Bigfoot, Sasquatch and Yeti. He is known as the Yeti or Abominable Snowman in the Asian mountain range of the Himalayas, but in the American Northwest he's called Bigfoot and the Sasquatch in Canada. But does he really exist? Four. The unicorn is similar to a horse with a white body and a long spiralled horn. Its horn is thought to protect people from poison. In fact, people hunted unicorns because they thought they could protect them from disease. Unicorns are gentle, friendly creatures. Track 33 one. Once there was a young shepherd boy who looked after his sheep at the bottom of a mountain near a dark forest. It was lonely for him all day, so he thought of a plan so he could get some friends to talk to. One day he rushed down towards the village shouting, Wolf! Wolf! And the villagers came out to meet him. This made the boy happy. So, a few days afterwards, he tried the same trick again. Once again, the villagers came to his help. But shortly after this, a wolf came out from the forest and began to walk around the sheep. The boy cried out, Wolf! Wolf! louder than before. But this time the villagers, who had been fooled twice before, thought the boy wasn't telling the truth again, and nobody came to help him. So, the wolf made a good meal of the boy's flock of sheep. When the boy complained, the wise man of the village said, A liar will not be believed, even when he speaks the truth. 2. One day, while Matt Jamble was out fishing, a large wave smashed into his boat. He hit his head and fell into the water. When he woke up, two turtles were helping him. The larger one helped him up to the surface of the water by swimming under him, and the smaller one bit him gently from time to time to keep him awake. Together, the turtles brought him to the shore near his village. When Matt Jamble told his friends what had happened, none of them believed him. He just smiled to himself. A few weeks later, a terrible storm came to the island. When the rain stopped, Matt Jamble went out to look at the sea. The beach was covered with turtles. There were turtles from one end of the beach to the other. They were very large and had strange markings on their grey shells. 
a little boy came running up the beach to Matt Jumble. Matt Jumble, he said, look at the turtles. What kind are they? What are they doing? Where did they come from? Matt Jumble smiled. You ask so many questions, he said. These are leatherback turtles. They don't usually lay their eggs here, but perhaps because of the storm, they have come here instead. Just think, they have come all the way from the Indian Ocean. Everyone in the village came to watch the turtles lay their eggs. The turtles dug holes in the sand and laid their eggs in the holes. Why don't we dance on the turtles for good luck, said one village woman. Matt Jamble laughed. <laughs> That's just a myth, he said. Also, you might hurt the turtles. Soon the turtles had finished laying their eggs. They covered the eggs with sand and then went back into the sea. One good turn deserves another. Track 34 When I was seven, I went camping with my family. We drove from Florida to Georgia and went camping in the Blue Ridge Range in Georgia. There were lots of great things to do. We went hiking, fishing and mountain biking. One day, I was walking in the mountains with my dad when we heard a strange noise in the trees. We thought it was an animal. Deer and black bears live in the Blue Ridge mountain range. We stopped to listen, but the noise stopped. But as we were walking again, we saw something behind a tree. We were very scared, and as we were looking for somewhere to hide, the creature ran off into the forest. I tried to get my camera, but it was too late. Was it just a bear, or was it Bigfoot? Track 35 The Lambton Worm One morning John Lambton was fishing, in the River Weir. He caught a fish upon his hook, but Lambton had no fear. Just what kind of fish it was, young Lambton could not tell. He couldn't be bothered to carry it home, so he threw it down a well. Now Lambton thought he would like to be a soldier and fight in wars. He joined a group of knights so tough, they didn't mind wounds or scars. They travelled far and had adventures, lots of stories he could tell. Very soon he forgot about the strange thing in the well. But the worm got fat and grew and grew and grew an awful size. It had great big teeth, a great big mouth and great big goggly eyes. And when at night it crawled about, having a little browse, if it felt thirsty on the way, it milked a dozen cows. This scary worm would often feed on calves and lambs and sheep and swallow little kids alive when they were fast asleep. And when it had eaten all it could, and it had had its fill. It crawled away and wrapped itself ten times round Penshaw Hill. The news of this awful worm and its strange goings-on soon crossed the seas and got to the ears of brave and bold Sir John. So home he came and caught the beast and cut it in two halves, and that soon stopped it eating kids and sheep and lambs and calves. So now you know how everyone on both sides of the weir lost lots of sheep and lots of sleep and lived in mortal fear. So let's say thanks to brave Sir John, who kept the kids from harm, saved cows and calves by making halves of the famous Lampton Worm. Track 36 He caught a fish upon his hook, but Lampton had no fear. Track 37 just what kind of fish it was, young Lampton could not tell. He couldn't be bothered to carry it home, so he threw it down a well. Track 38 1. I like to discover and find out about different parts of the world. In my profession, you need to be brave and determined to succeed.
Two. At school, I used to win competitions for my drawings and paintings, so I knew from an early age what I wanted to be when I was older. You need to be very creative in my profession. Three. I like to spend hours doing experiments and observing things in order to find solutions to different problems. You need to be very determined and intelligent in my profession. Four. I direct large groups of actors and actresses during filming. We have to do lots of takes to get a part of the film just right. In my profession, you need to be positive, creative, and fun to work with. Track thirty-nine. One. There's lots of information about ancient Egypt on this page. Look, it says that ancient Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations of the past. Egypt is in northeast Africa, and the ancient Egyptians lived on the banks of the River Nile. It says here that the pyramids were the stone tombs of Egypt's kings, the pharaohs. Two. Look, here it is. It says it's a huge stone sculpture of a creature with the body of a lion and the head of a human. It is believed that the Great Sphinx of Giza guarded the tomb of the king from tomb raiders. Three. In ancient Rome, they had some incredible buildings. It says that as cities got bigger in ancient Rome. Fresh water was a problem, and people started to die because they were drinking dirty water from the rivers. So they started to build long stone channels called aqueducts to carry clean water from the hills nearby to the towns. Four. Amphitheatres were places where the Romans went for entertainment. They had a central stage with rows of seats around it. They are quite similar to a modern football stadium. People used to watch fights between gladiators and wild animals, such as lions and bears. Look, this was the largest amphitheatre in the Roman Empire, the Colosseum. Track forty. Part one. Today, I'm going to talk about life in ancient Rome. First of all, I'm going to describe the houses in ancient Rome. Most people lived in apartment buildings in noisy, narrow streets, but rich people lived in big, beautiful homes. The very early Romans wore togas. They looked like a white sheet. Togas were arranged very carefully in a stylish way. The Romans didn't like togas because they were difficult to wear and they were cold, so they changed to more comfortable tunics, which looked like long t-shirts. They were far more practical. Roman boys wore a tunic down to their knees. Roman girls wore a simple tunic with a belt at the waist. When they went outside, they wore a second tunic that reached their feet. There were lots of different jobs in Rome. The people who lived in the country were usually farmers, and they made food for the people who lived in the city. In the city, there were craftsmen who made dishes, jewelry, and weapons, and the more educated Romans who were teachers or engineers. Many men were part of the Roman army. Typical food in ancient Rome was bread, beans, fish, dried fruit, vegetables, and cheese. Poor Romans didn't eat a lot of meat, but they did eat some very strange things, such as mice and snails. Entertainment was very popular in ancient Rome, and most events were free. The Romans liked chariot racing and watching plays in amphitheaters. The Romans also loved bathing and usually visited the local public baths once a day. There were about nine hundred public baths in ancient Rome. Track 
41. Part 2. The Romans were skilled engineers and builders. They showed us how to build straight roads and how to transport water via aqueducts, bridges that carry water. They were the very first civilization to heat houses with central heating. Children loved to play in ancient Rome, and we still play many of the games they play today, such as dice games, board games, marbles, and hide-and-seek. The Roman number system, called Roman numerals, is also still used around the world. We can still see them on clock faces, in kings and queens names, and even in the Super Bowl numbering. Track 42 There's a Pharaoh in our bath by Jeremy Strong Part 1 The lid of the cobwebbed coffin was slowly pushed back and the two men laid it carefully on the museum floor. They stared inside at the beautifully painted ancient Egyptian mummy case covered with picture writing. Daylight was already beginning to fade from the musty storeroom. The other museum staff had gone home, and the only company left with the two men now were the stacks of old mummy cases, ancient skeletons and a large stuffed rhinoceros. Professor Jelly pulled the lamp closer and inspected the hieroglyphs. The light shimmered across his moon-like face. What does it say? demanded Grimstone. The head of the museum's ancient Egyptian collection stared over Jelly's shoulder. Is it the mummy of the missing pharaoh? Part 2 Professor Jelly took a sweet from his jacket pocket, popped it in his mouth and bent over the mummy case. Mmm, hazelnut crunch. Now this squiggly bit here says... May perfumed flowers be crushed beneath his feet. Very poetic. But who's inside? Grimstone barked impatiently, and his great winged eyebrows crashed together over his hooded eyes and hawk nose. He stabbed a thin finger at one side of the coffin. What about here? What does it say? It looks important. Professor Jelly sucked noisily on his sweet. That bit there? Yes. That says, please keep this way up at all times. What? yelled Grimstone. And that bit, continued the professor, waving at some faded hieroglyphs with a pudgy hand, that bit there says, not to be opened before Christmas. For a few seconds, Grimstone was stunned. Then his eyes glinted dangerously. You're making this up, Jelly, aren't you? The professor straightened his tubby frame. Of course I'm making it up. Stop pestering me and let me study it properly. This mummy has been stuck here for 70 years already, Ever since it was first brought to the museum from ancient Egypt for the collection. A few more minutes wait won't hurt. Part 3 This could be the discovery of the century. It could make our fortunes. We could be millionaires. The clue to a fabulous treasure is in that coffin. He turned his back to the professor. Come on, Jelly. Get a move on. The professor was still translating the hieroglyphs on the coffin's side. He who opens this coffin will be cursed by Anubis. There now, just our luck. We're going to be cursed by Anubis. Who's Anubis? demanded Grimstone. He was the ancient Egyptian god of the dead. Had a head like a jackal. Track 43 1 But who's inside? 2 Of course I'm making it up! 3 This could be the discovery of the century. It could make our fortunes. 
four. You're making this up, Jelly, aren't you? Track 44 1. I live in Qatar. It's dry and warm here, but sometimes it's extremely windy as well. We call these sandstorms haboobs. Once, I was in the car with my dad travelling home from school when I saw a wall of sand through the back window of our car. Dad thought it was travelling at about 80 kilometres per hour, so we quickly found somewhere to stop indoors before the storm hit. It lasted for three hours and covered everything with sand. 2. I live in Canada, and during the winter months we have lots of heavy snow and strong winds called blizzards. Last year, it snowed for a whole week without stopping, which is quite normal where I live. Our car was completely covered in snow, and we had to use a shovel to make a path through the snow out of our front door. We had no electricity for two days either, so we had to light candles in the evening so we could see. 3. I'm from Taiwan. In Taiwan, we have violent storms called typhoons. In other parts of the world, they are called hurricanes or cyclones. We are used to these storms and we can get three to four typhoons a year. The high winds and heavy rain cause a lot of damage to buildings and sometimes cause flash flooding. So it's best to stay indoors until a storm has finished. 4. I'm from Bangladesh. Severe flooding in my country is very common, especially in the monsoon season. This happens in the summer when we get most of our rainfall. The problem is we get torrential rain and then we get flooding. Last month, a nearby village was flooded. A lot of people lost their homes and animals. The roads were flooded with water so cars couldn't get to the village and schools and shops were closed. Track 45 During a severe sandstorm, it's best to close all the windows and doors in your house and to stay inside. If you are outside during a sandstorm, then you should make sure your body is covered in clothing, otherwise the sand and other flying objects could hurt you. You should also wear a mask and goggles to protect your eyes. You shouldn't drive during a sandstorm, as you won't be able to see the road very well. Finally, if you are with a camel in the desert during a sandstorm, then sit it down and lie against its side. Camels are used to sandstorms, so don't worry. Track 46 1. And here's a quick weather update. Today was a beautiful day, so let's see what it will be like tomorrow. Tomorrow will be quite warm with temperatures of about 21 degrees Celsius. In the afternoon, it might be a little wet with some rain in mountain areas. Make sure you have a jumper or a coat if you're going out in the evening because it will be very cold with temperatures of 5 degrees Celsius. I'll be back at 8 o'clock with a full report, but now I'll hand over. 2. Good evening and welcome to Global News. Today, Friday the 9th of August. We start with a warning about a typhoon which is coming in across the south of the island. The typhoon will be the worst at 4pm tomorrow when there will be extremely heavy rain and high winds. The storm should pass by 8pm. So please stay indoors during the storm. Temperatures during the day tomorrow will be about 28 degrees Celsius and it will be extremely humid. The temperature will drop to about 23 degrees Celsius at night. Good night and don't forget to take care of yourself. Track 47 Good evening and welcome to Global News. Today, Friday the 9th of August. We start with a warning about a typhoon which is coming in across the south of the island. 
The typhoon will be the worst at 4 pm tomorrow, when there will be extremely heavy rain and high winds. The storm should pass by 8 pm. So please stay indoors during the storm. Temperatures during the day tomorrow will be about 28 degrees Celsius and it will be extremely humid. The temperature will drop to about 23 degrees Celsius at night. Good night and don't forget to take care. Track 48 A Visit with Mr Tree Frog by Cathy Pazin I have a tiny buddy. Tree Frog is his name. He flew in from Brazil in his tiny toy plane. He rattles when he speaks. He's greener than green grass. He is a tree hugger that really is first class. He has bright orange toes that wiggle in the night. He's a mellow fellow that does not like to fight. He dines on crickets and flies, and moths are for a treat. He's not the average guy you find on city streets. He was born in a forest, a forest with warm rain. He is an earthly treasure that has a claim to fame. He has a magic slime that can cure laziness. His slime can cure the world, and yet he's poisonous. His eyes are really red. They pop up like snaps. He blinks when he's resting. During the day, he naps. He is here to brainstorm about our planet so green. He's a wonder of our world. The cutest I've ever seen. Track 49 If I Were a Sloth by Cathy Pazin If I were a sloth hanging from a tree, I could show the world my personality. I would see the world hanging upside down, dangling like a coconut high above the ground. I would nap all day in the canopy of the rainforest cecropia trees. I would move real slow, slow as slow can be, hiding from Jaguar, my fierce enemy. I am nocturnal. I only play at night. When the sun goes down, I like to grab a bite. I can whistle like a bird. I am really rare. With my long, long arms, people like to stare. In my grey-green coat, I will always thrive. I'm a little sloth. I make the jungle jive. Track 50 1. This is the ancient civilization part of the museum we are walking into now. On the left, you can see a working model of a Roman aqueduct which shows how fresh water was transported into the big cities. An incredible piece of engineering. 2. Here is a full-size replica of a Roman chariot. I believe that this one was used in the film Gladiator. Romans loved chariot races, which were held on special racetracks called circuses. 3. This is a tunic which all Roman men wore. It could be worn on its own or with a belt around the waist. It was also worn under a toga, which was a longer piece of material worn around the body and over one arm. 4. Moving on, we come to ancient Egypt. Here we have an authentic canopic jar, which was used to put the organs of the king's body in, such as the liver and the stomach. 5. Next to this, we have examples of hieroglyphics. Egyptians use these pictures to represent objects, actions and sounds. 6. I'm sure you already know what this is. It's a sphinx, which archaeologists believed were built to guard the tomb and to frighten away tomb raiders. 
Track 51. 1. This is a reptile called a horned viper snake. It lives in the Sahara Desert in Africa, where it's very dry and hot. It likes to bury itself in the sand, where it waits for its prey. Lizards and birds are its favourites. 2. The stick insect looks like the twigs and branches of the trees it lives on. It lives in forests all over the world and likes to eat the leaves of the trees. It's nocturnal, so it spends most of the day keeping very still, hidden in plants and trees, so birds don't see it and eat it. It eats leaves and other small bugs. 3. The elephant seal is an aquatic mammal that lives in the Antarctic. It is extremely cold, but the elephant seal has a lot of fat on its body to help to keep it warm. It spends most of its time hunting fish, octopus and squid under the water. 4. A clownfish lives in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, where the sea is warm. It's called a clownfish because it's very colourful and active. It eats algae, which are small plants, and small fish, and it lives around anemones, which help protect it from predators. 5. This amphibian is called an African dwarf frog. It lives in freshwater rivers and ponds in Africa where it is cool. It's called a dwarf frog because it's so tiny. It eats bloodworms and water fleas and spends most of its time underwater. 6. This bird lives in the Swiss mountain ranges. It's a golden eagle, one of the largest birds of prey. It's used to living in cold conditions and it makes its nest high up in the mountain rocks. It eats hares, foxes and birds which live on the ground. 7. This animal lives in the African savannah where it is hot all year round. It's a medium-sized mammal called an antelope and it likes to eat a lot of grass. It has horns to protect itself from predators such as lions and hyenas. Track 52 Today, I like to talk to you about my pet. We live on a farm and there are lots of animals. My younger brother David has a rabbit and my older sister Hannah has a guinea pig, but my pet is much bigger than this. I've got a horse and his name is Heathcliff. I love horses. My mum said a horse was too expensive, but we saw Heathcliff at a sanctuary where they help horses to get better. He wasn't well looked after and he was poorly. So he is a special horse because we rescued him. Heathcliff and I are best friends and he needs a lot of looking after. He needs feeding twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. I give him hay and sometimes apples and carrots for a treat. You must give your horse food and fresh water every day. Here are some more tips for horse care. You should groom your horse regularly. It's best to use a brush or a special comb. A horse needs lots of exercise, so I try to ride him twice a day. When I can't ride him, he spends some of the day in the field where he has lots of room to run around. It's important that a horse goes for regular checkups at the vets. It's a good idea to check your horse's teeth on a regular basis too. Track 53 Mum Won't Let Me Keep a Rabbit by Brian Patton Mum won't let me keep a rabbit. She won't let me keep a bat. She won't let me keep a porcupine or a water rat. I can't keep pigeons and I can't keep snails. I can't keep kangaroos or wallabies with nails. She won't let me keep a rattlesnake or a viper in the house. She won't let me keep a mamba or its meal, a mouse. She won't let me keep a wombat and it isn't very clear why I can't keep iguanas, jellyfish or deer. I can't keep a cockroach or a bumblebee 
I can't keep an earwig, a maggot or a flea. I can't keep a wildebeest and it's just my luck. I can't keep a mallard, a dab chick or a duck. She won't let me keep piranhas, toads or even frogs. She won't let me keep an octopus or muddy water hogs. So out in the garden I keep a pet ant. And up in the attic, tna pele terkes a... Track 54 1. Bat Water rat 2. Snails Nails 3. Deer Clear 4. Bumblebee Flea 5. Duck Luck 6. Water hogs Frogs Track 55 1. Larry the Lucky Lion laughed loudly as he leaped over Lucy the Lazy Lizard while she lovingly licked a lemon lollipop. 2. Charlie the Cheerful Cheetah chose to chew cheese and cherries as he chomped his chops. Track 56 Hello, my name's Hero. What's yours? Hi, I'm Ben. Where are you from? I'm from Tokyo. And you? I'm from New York. Have you got any brothers or sisters? Yes, I've got an older brother. And you? I'm an only child. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, there's just me. I haven't got any brothers or sisters. Do you have a favourite sport? Yes, I really like playing baseball and table tennis. Me too. Well, I'm not so keen on baseball, but I love playing table tennis. What are you like? Well, I think I'm quite hardworking and cheerful, but my mum doesn't think so. She thinks I'm a bit lazy. Not true, of course. <laughs> Just like my mom. I'm quite hardworking, but mom says I spent too much time playing computer games. Well, we both like playing computer games then. Which one is your favorite? Track 57 1. What do you like? 2. Where are you from? 3. Do you like playing computer games? 4. Are you outgoing? Track 58 1. What fruit did you buy? I bought a bunch of grapes and a bag of oranges. 2. What would you like for lunch? A bowl of soup, please, and some bread and butter. 3. Should I add some salt and pepper to the soup? Yes, please, but not too much salt. Track 59 Hi, I'm Chung, and I live in Beijing. One hundred years ago, my city was very different to how it is today. In old Beijing, Entire families lived together around a courtyard called a siharian. Around the yard were small houses, one for the older family members and another for the younger family members. There was also a sitting room and eating area for everyone to meet and eat. However, these houses didn't have proper kitchens, bathrooms or toilets, so... I don't think life was very easy. People walked or rode their bicycles to get around the city instead of going in the cars we see on the roads today. Today, there are thousands and thousands of cars on the city streets. However, in my opinion, we should ride our bikes more because the air in the city is very polluted. Nowadays, 
Many families live in small, high-rise apartment blocks. My apartment has all kinds of modern appliances. We've got a fridge, a microwave, a dishwasher, a television, and mobile phones. I really like going out with my friends, and we have lots of shopping malls and cinemas nearby. So there's lots to do in modern Beijing. I think that living in Beijing now is probably better than 100 years ago. Track 60 1. Cooked Watched Started 2. Lived Played Needed 3. Painted, washed, talked. Track 61 1. Tough, bought, enough. 2. Dough, rough, though. 3. Thought, bought. Enough. Track 62. 1. 155,000. 2. 16,865. 3. 12 million. 4. 27,700. 5. 188 million. 6. 476,000. Track 63. Today, I'm going to talk about a remarkable man, Nelson Mandela. He was born in South Africa in 1918 and had a happy childhood. When he began his studies to be a lawyer, he learned about the apartheid system in South Africa. Mandela believed in racial equality and decided to fight for the rights of black people in his country. He was put in prison for 27 years and wasn't released until 1990. He became the first black president of South Africa in 1994. Track 64 One. Nelson Mandela was born in 1918, wasn't he? 2. He studied to be a lawyer, didn't he? 3. He was one of the most respected people in the world, wasn't he? 4. Mother Teresa dedicated her life to helping others, didn't she? 5. She was very generous with her time and love, wasn't she? Track 65 This scary worm would often feed on calves and lambs and sheep and swallow little kids alive when they were fast asleep. Track 66 I found out that the ancient Romans loved playing games in their leisure time. They played ball games and they enjoyed flying kites on windy days too. Boys liked to play war games and girls played with dolls made of material or clay. Both boys and girls loved to play a game called Tali. Nowadays, it's called knuckle bones. In Tali, players roll four four-sided dice with the sides marked 1, 3, 4 and 6. Most of the scoring was based on numerical value. The pieces were usually made from animal bones, but were also made of silver, gold, marble, glass and wood. The four tali were dropped from a height onto a table or the floor, and the score was calculated from the numbers on the sides facing up. Track 67 1. 
Shall I open the school report now? Two. Why did you do that? Three. Mum, are you ready now? Four. Open the door. It could be him. Track 68. Tomorrow there will be very high winds, so be extremely careful if you are driving or out walking. Track 69. Grass. Class. Plane. Name. Fight. Night. Street. Treat. Naps. Snaps. Scene. Green. Track 70. Hi, my name's Paolo, and I'm going to talk to you about my pet hamster, Cheeks. I decided on this name because he loves to fill his cheeks with his favorite food, seeds and grains. I fill his bowl with food twice a day, and it's important that he always has fresh water in his water bottle too. Hamsters are very active, so it's a good idea to buy an exercise wheel for their cage. Cheeks loves it. He's got a ladder too, as he's a great climber. I clean out Cheeks' cage once a week. I clean the bottom with soap and water, and I put down fresh bedding. Hamsters are clean animals. They organize an area in their cage for sleeping and another for their toilet area. They clean and groom themselves regularly too by licking their fur. Believe it or not, a hamster's teeth never stop growing. So it's a good idea to give it wood chews or a hard dog biscuit to keep your hamster's teeth short.